if you're a business owner, there's going to come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system when, with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There's a better way to create a website, a professional, crisp website you'll be proud to publish, and it just takes seconds. This is all thanks to Hostinger's AI website generator. I recently took this for a test drive, even shared this on my YouTube channel. It was mind-blowing. Not just how quick you can build a website, but with the AI, how great it actually can write copy for you. You can use the AI logo maker, plus it got it up in no time, and it looks good. Absolutely mind-blowing. So if you want to build a website, go to Hostinger, because they're a top, highly rated global web hosting platform. And all you have to do to build a website is just answer three questions and let the AI do all the work for you. You can build as many web pages as you need without knowing how to code a single line of anything. They have great support, too. That was one thing that I had a problem with with a with a with another host back in the day. Hostinger has 24-7 support and a library of video guides. And here's the thing. You can do this for less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. That is crazy. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast, you can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name, H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. Give it a spin. Pat, I mean this sincerely. I love surfing as much as you love Back to the Future. <laughs> James Schramko on the show with us today from superfastbusiness.com, a passionate surfer, but also passionate about working less and making more and helping people like us learn how to do the same. So make sure you stick around. This is going to be a good one. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he believes that sometime in his lifetime, he'll see a human land on Mars, Pat Flynn. Job searches can feel like they're taking forever, a real slog. So stop searching and just match with Indeed. So ditch the busy work, use Indeed for scheduling, screening, messaging, so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. If you want to hire fast, you need to go where the talent is. You get unparalleled access to job seekers with over 350 million unique visitors globally, according to Indeed data, and an extended reach through Glassdoor. I love how adaptable Indeed is uh, as well, whether you're hiring one person or you need lots for a scalable project, like hiring platform that lets you schedule and interview hundreds of candidates in one day, like there's no other one that you would want to use. So join more than three and a half million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash Smart Passive. Just go to Indeed.com slash Smart Passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash Smart Passive. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30 day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. 
I mean, they even make a height adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation size ping pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you wanna build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for joining me in session 319 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. My name is Pat Flynn. I'm here to help you make more money, save more time, and help more people too. And on the show with us, we have my good friend James Schramko from Super Fast Business, somebody who I've known throughout the years as somebody who's just been crushing it online, but only recently, uh, and by recently, I mean the last couple of years, we've gotten to know each other pretty well in person at different events we've been speaking at. And I swear, whenever I see him speak on stage, I am just just focused on what he's saying because he's teaching me so many things and I wanted to bring him on the show today to teach you so many things. He's also the author of a new book called Work Less, Make More and uh, he's gonna teach us exactly how to do that today. So without further ado, here's James Schramko from superfastbusiness.com and the Superfast Business Podcast. James Schramko, welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Uh, Finally, you're here. I'm so thankful well, Pat, I'm the one who's thankful. You have got such an inspired audience now. You've been working very hard on that. And to be here is uh, something I have a lot of gratitude for. So thank you. Yeah, no, this is going to be great. You you just came out with a new book called uh, Work Less, Make Make More. But before we get into that, you know, you've been doing online business for how many years now? I started in the end of 2005 and I went full time almost 10 years ago to the month, almost. Well, congratulations on that. Well, thank and you. you've done very well for yourself. You've helped uh, not only you yourself live an amazing lifestyle and be able to literally surf the world, uh, which is your passion, but more than that, you've helped thousands of people build lifestyles that they want to. I mean, we're, we're talking big names that a lot of us know. We don't have to get into those names right now, but um, you've helped shape the lives of many, many people, and I'm excited to hopefully help to shape, uh, shape the lives of those who are listening today too. And you've helped shape mine too because we actually um, hung out a little bit in Australia and uh, it was at Darren Rouse's Pro Blogger Conference and I saw you speak on stage and a lot of what you were teaching was like exactly what I needed to hear. And you know, the funny thing for everybody listening uh, about James is he's very pragmatic. He's very just, you know, let's do the minimum amount to do the maximum amount of effort. And we always hear about the, you know, the 80-20 rule but James lives that. James teaches that. So I'm excited to have you on today. And I want to ask you, first off, um, where are entrepreneurs most impractical? You live this simple decision lifestyle. Why is it so hard for all of us to live a simple decision lifestyle like you? Like you? I think there are a lot of obstacles to living the lifestyle that I have. And one of them is not being aware of the possibilities, which is what I hoped to bridge by writing a book about it. But I think we have been trained from an early age through the school system, through our parents who mm. who love us in most cases and who care a lot about us, but they came up in a different era. And as the more I studied about uh, business and being an entrepreneur, the more I realized there's a different set of rules out there. And once you become aware of new formulas, new uh, models for living and open your eyes to this stuff, then some of it just falls away. So I literally retrained and reprogrammed the way that I think about things to be able to have a different life. So, I mean, even if you look at it on a surface level, If most people are in a job, paying off a mortgage, uh, doing the usual sort of thing, school, college, et cetera, uh, getting loans, and they're not entirely happy and they have this idea of perhaps retiring when they're 65, then it makes sense to do something different. So I was uh, looking for that difference and I read a lot of business books and self-development books in my early 20s. And I think through that decade, I made significant growth and mostly because I started implementing the stuff that I was reading. It's one thing to know about the book, to get the book, but to read it and then implement it, that's what really makes the big difference. I think people are living a theoretical idea of what they could do, but they're not realizing the potential of it because they're not actually trying this stuff and open to doing things differently. What was the most influential book that you read? 
and what did you learn from it? I would say it's Jay Abraham's book, Getting Everything You Can Out of All You Got. Because I remember it was about 1995, so it's quite a long time ago, I was the top BMW salesperson in the whole of Australia. And Anthony Robbins was coming to town and someone else in my office was going to see the conference. And as part of that, they released some book summaries. And one of the book summaries was summarizing a Jay Abraham book. And in there was a specific little uh, script about how to help milk bar owners. And I thought, this is crazy. He actually trained a milk bar owner. Instead of asking if the customer would like an egg in their milkshake, apparently this was a thing. It's not in Australia, but maybe it was in America in the old days. Uh, He said, change that to, would you like one egg or two? And I thought, that is so clever just a small change of the wording and such a different outcome in profit. So now everyone was getting an egg or two instead of maybe some and maybe not others. So I went on this pursuit of J. Abraham material and it uh, keeps recurring in my life. This guy has been a good influence on me because his book was so practical and profound. And then when I went searching for his information later, that's when I tripped over this whole affiliate marketing online scene. I didn't know anything about copywriting, didn't know about affiliate marketing. It was looking for his book that I accidentally got name squeezed by a couple of marketers called Rich Sheffren and Stephen Pierce. And they had all these sort of highlighted, yellow, bolded, italicized words. And it was very compelling. And they wanted my email address to send me free J. Abraham reports. And I thought that was amazing. And they said, if you give away these reports, then we'll send you commission because some people will buy our information product. You just go to this site called ClickBank and you get a, <laughs> an affiliate link. And so I set about trying to figure out where I'm going to put this affiliate link. And that led me down the path of trying to build a website or initially a web page on my internet service provider's account. And then uh, six months later, I'd figured out how to actually put up a website. (laughs) It was so hard, Pat. It was just so hard. But that was my first real success as an affiliate was finding website software that was easy to use. And then where did you go from there? How did you grow into, you know, the James Shramko that we all know who is helping serve thousands of other businesses and, and business owners? Well, at that time, I'd worked my way all the way through to the role of general manager. So I was on a circa $300,000 a year salary. I was getting paid by one business owner, which I'm sure you would know um, from your architect scenario. (laughs) That's dangerous. Yes. And there was an American financial collapse happening with subprime lending. And, And I'd been through this as a kid. My dad lost his job when I was smaller and it had an effect on me and I was determined not to put myself in that position. So I scrambled to have my own business like Jay Abraham was talking about. I just didn't know what. But through this uh, trial and error of building a website, I thought, you know what, there's probably other people who are just like me trying to figure out how to build a website. And I started this affiliate website showing how capable this software was. And I taught myself not only how to build a website, but how to write sales copy how to design graphics. Uh, I was obsessed with figuring out how to make video and audio, which in 2006 was actually quite hard. And I mean, this is pre-Facebook pages and and Facebook ads. You can't just switch up a page and turn it on like we can now. And then uh, I started selling more and more of this software. I learned about SEO in particular. And I was sort of adding a few hundred dollars a month to my income and Eventually, I came up with this strategy of creating a bonus to create additional value. This is really before it was a popular concept as it is now. I was seeing how could I complement this software and create something. So I put together my SOP, which was actually a few lines of uh, notes in an Excel spreadsheet. This was my SOP, what I do with a website once I've built it to make it uh, more easily found in Google. I would go and change things like the site map and the page title structure, et cetera. So I'd put this into a little PDF and I would give it away as a cheat sheet for people who bought through me. And this accelerated sales. And eventually someone emailed me and said, hey, 
I've already got the software, but this guy on a forum is raving about it. He says he's got some cheat sheet that he got because he bought it from you. Would you sell it to me? Mm. And so I replied back and I said, okay, if you PayPal me $40, because my commission used to be $49.25, I'll send you the cheat sheet. And he did. And the next day, I got more emails this guy had shared this, hey, you can actually buy the cheat sheet separately. And now I got seven or eight emails the next night when I came home from work. Yeah. Will you sell me the cheat sheet? So I went and registered a domain and I started selling this. I actually started as a warrior special offer. And that first week, I happened to be moving house. I sold $1,000 a day worth of the cheat sheet in its first week. No and I way. had this, yeah, I had this like... <laughs> thunderbolt it's like wow you know if i could just do this instead of going to work i could actually you know make this a living this is a thing and that was really the seed and, and once i sunk my teeth into that there was no letting go and it was an obsession and for it was two and a half years of doing two jobs general manager by day with a 50 million dollar a year revenue business with 70 something staff and at night i was a solopreneur with no staff, doing absolutely everything myself, making every mistake you can possibly make, the slowest business growth known to man. And eventually, I transitioned uh, what I knew from my day job into my part-time job. I would actually sit in the dealership and look around from my office and I would think, wow, what if all these people worked for me? Well, I'd have that person over there doing keyword research <laughs> and that person over there writing articles and that person answering all these bonus support desk queries and that person building my website. It was like a fantasy really, but I was so obsessed with it, Pat. And I just stuck with it. And over time, I hired a, a support desk person and then an article writer. And I lifted myself out of uh, out of sort of nothingness into something. And I got to this frustrating level where I was about $150,000 a year with my Excite Pro cheat sheet and software affiliate business. But that was only half my salary. And my trigger, and this is how I do things these days, I set trigger points. When I reach this... I do that. So it's like an if this, then that. Yeah. When I match my salary, I'm going to quit my job. But I was only halfway there. So I needed a, a major transition point and I was kind of stuck. And then a series of events unfolded that catapulted me up to my salary and I was able to quit. And this is almost 10 years ago. And from there, even though I've made really good money, like six figures per month, pretty much every month for about eight or nine years straight, maybe close to 10, my business model has changed many times uh, because I'm a master of adaptation. And uh, you know, I'm not sure which parts of that you want to know because that's a decade, so I, I wouldn't want to drag it past its uh, expiry date. Yeah, well, thank you for checking in with me. But still, I mean, I think that that's something that, you know, it's interesting when you get into business, and I know this from my own experience and helping to teach others, once you get a taste of online business, I mean, it becomes something that you obsess over and you overwork yourself with, you get overwhelmed with all the decisions that you can make. At what point from that journey when you started, you know, full time with this and now, did you understand systems and, you know, working less but making more or had you ever been at, at, to that point where you're kind of, you're just so deep into it, you get so overwhelmed, almost burned out, or had you always started out kind of as a systems person and just ensuring that, you know, you're putting the least amount of work to get in the most results? Well, by day, I was Superman, and at night, I was Clark Kent. It was frustrating because at my general manager role, I had literally systemized the place to within an inch of its life. Like, I had made my role redundant, which was adding and compounding to my danger. I had systems in place. I had procedures for everything. I had the right people in the right positions doing all the things they were supposed to. We, were, we had a huge profit turnaround from a loss to a, a big profit within the four years, which was my job there. I started there to save this place and we turned it into a, a fantastic result. So it was really frustrating to be there at night, just me, you know, falling asleep on the keyboard at three in the morning and then getting up again at, at seven to go off to work again. So that was just 
so frustrating. So yes, I I already knew about systems, and and really uh, a short answer to your previous question is the way that I've been able to create a lot of value for people is when I actually found my feed online. I realised that most small entrepreneurs have not had general management training. They don't understand about reports and systems and organizing themselves and leading a team and choosing the right business models and having filters. They don't get trained for that in a normal sort of regular job. So I was able to bring a lot of value by teaching them actual business insights. But for me, the process was painfully difficult because I think one of the huge obstacles when you start online is finding that first thing that will make you money. And that, of course, is an obsession. And most people obsess on the first part of that, which is getting customers. Mm -hmm. And I know you've got a whole book on Will It Fly? But getting that thing that will sell is such a big part of it. And because I didn't have that, I wasn't reinvesting the profits that I didn't have into a team (laughs) that I didn't need because I didn't have a profit that, you know, that could support them. So it's this vicious cycle of despair. But once I started getting traction, I started reinvesting in team. And that's why I did the numbers. And it was probably one of the hardest hires that I've made. This isn't me spending someone else's money. This is me spending my own profit back on someone who I'm going to hire on the basis that after the work they do, I'll still have more profit. And this is really where I started refining that effective hourly rate concept, where I was happy to hire people for less than what I could make from whatever they were generating for me. And through careful hiring, I built up my team. And in fact, at its peak, Pat, I had uh, 66 people working for me. What? In, in my own, like, here's the reality. I made more profit in my online business and I hired the same amount of people as the last place that I worked, which was a $50 million a year revenue business. But car dealerships make very small margins. Most car dealerships make 1% to 2% profit if they make a profit. And and that's, that's a staggeringly low profit margin. I wouldn't recommend anyone get a car dealership. Uh, but, yeah, I, I just reached this – this sort of reality that I'd actually created a virtual business that was more powerful than the one that I used to work for. Uh, In the end, of course, I sold my SEO service business and along with that, the team that were part of that business. And I also sold my website development business and the team that went along with that. But in the process of uh, starting, growing, building and, and dominating in those markets and then selling the businesses, I learned so much in that experience has been valuable for me to be able to help other people if they're in any of those phases, whether it's just starting out or at the point where they're ready to sell their business. So let's talk about that. If we're just starting out and you're trying to get that traction like you were talking about before you can start reinvesting in your business and begin to start hiring a team and such, how do you, what is your formula for doing that? You know, I I talk about the formula through will it fly and validating a business idea. I'm interested to hear from your perspective and your experience especially coming from sort of a GM point of view in all your years. Um, how do you recommend people who are listening to this right now who are like, I don't even, you know, I just listen because I'm inspired by it. I have, I have no idea what, what to do. What do you say to them? Yeah, well, it's, uh, firstly, welcome to uh, having your own business. It's exciting, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Um, and the second part, it gets better, right? <laughs> it's really the holy grail. I would say list the potential markets that you have access to. So a market is a group of people. And then I would say list down the products or services that they are already buying because that's a huge clue. It's hard to convince people they need something, but if they already know they need it, that's that's a bit better. And then shortlist one or two of them for research and then work on your offer, like craft your offer. And there's, there's sort of easy ways to do that. I actually break down a formula for it. And I think you saw a whole presentation I did on, on uh, selling because mm-hmm. this is probably an obstacle that some people have. And then after that, after you make your offer, collect payment. Get someone to buy it as early as possible, even if it's in a pre-phase. And once you've been able to do that, we call that validating the offer. Then you create your low re- resolution solution. Like what's the minimum you could deliver to fulfill your end of the bargain, deliver it, of course, and then scale. So that's the exciting part. That's the part where I spend most of my time with scaling that offer that converts. And 
and then of course it, you go into refinement mode. You start tracking and reporting and seeing what happens and looking for those innovations and adapting with the changing market. Mm-hmm. Which is why over the last decade, I've had different business models and and things have come and gone. But I've probably got the most stable business of anyone I know. I've I've not actually dipped below six figures for for almost that entire time because I'm so adaptable, and that's. That's where people go wrong. Often they become single source dependent or they forget to innovate. And may I ask you what kind of business model you are running right now? Oh, yes, of course you may. Uh, So now, uh, predominantly coaching. So I just have two programs. They're both recurring. And there's an easy sort of entry-level package and then there's a higher level package for people who are already usually they're making seven figures already that sort of market because there's not many people serving that market well and just to the side of that pat there are a couple of things and i'd say this is akin to your uh truck shop things that you do Mm -hmm. Uh, i have a, a surfing website because it's my absolute passion and it's really handy to be able to buy and sell stock and uh, go on photographic missions to exotic islands uh, for the business, of course. And uh, then there's uh, – but beyond the coaching, I actually partner with people at a, at a very high level. If if someone's a sort of customer who's going to be around forever, then I'll do what Jay Abraham told me to do, and that is to take a very small percentage of revenue to be their silent partner. And I have a few of those tucked away in the background – And that combination gives me enormous protection from any downturns because dealing with uh, the US, the UK and the Australian markets. So I've got a a currency spread. I've got thousands of customers and I'm in different market segments. So I, I feel good about that and I don't have any services anymore. Having sold the website development, having sold SEO, I feel really good about that and I'm not currently doing anything in regards to software as a service or any sort of physical e-commerce stuff. The only physical thing I have these days is a soft cover book. Mm -hmm. Had you ever done digital courses and and that kind of thing for a while? The way that I package my coaching, I've put my digital courses inside my coaching because I think you need three things to have a fantastic community-related business. The, the best way to coach someone to get results is high frequency and small, easy steps and really good information. So the three components that I bundled together, are the content, which was putting all my courses and live event trainings and uh, I do a, a monthly brand new training. So, for example, the presentations that you saw me present at Darren's fabulous event mm-hmm. and a, a big hat tip to that event. What a, what a great event uh, that ProBlogger runs. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, they became trainings for my members. That's an example of what a member would get each month, like how to automatically sell memberships on, you know, without having to pick up the phone. That's one of the trainings. Another one's how to sell and remain friends with your customers. So that's an example. So I put my content in there. The second part is the coaching. So I actually individually help people with their own scenarios so that it can be fully customized to their situation. They can privately bear their soul to me. They can tell me their insecurities, their vulnerabilities, their biggest hangups, and no one else can see it. And I answer it for them. And then the third part is, of course, the community. They can peer-to-peer network with other people of the same sort of level and interest and swap the you know best case scenarios and share success stories to encourage each other and, and also s- swap resources. And I'm curious because you know, you're known for working less, making more. And I would imagine you would make a lot more by doing the coaching program, recurring revenue, that sort of thing. But that, to me, and I think to a lot of people – might seem like it's actually working more because it's taking a lot of your time and, you know, teach passive income. And, you know, even though there's no such thing as 100% passive income, there are things that are less passive than coaching. How do you respond to, to the working less versus, you know, coaching? Well, I mean, factually, I work less <laughs> because I measure it and yeah. something you can do. <laughs> well, I, there you go. I, I post, you know, 20 to 25 hours a week on my business, which includes all my coaching calls any time I spend in my forum and things like podcasts. 
the I don't count thinking time, but I'm generally doing that on a surfboard or um, you know I, I still I'm pretty up with Netflix these days. Yeah, and uh, I go out most days with my wife. So. Um, the way that I do it, it's very leveraged. If you have a leveraged system, it can work. Uh, in any type of product or service where there's a fulfillment aspect, you will have somewhat of a uh, bell curve. There'll be a few hyper users. There'll be the most people use something most of the time, and then there'll be some who are completely stagnant or missing in action. Mm. Uh, so you do whatever you can with a subscription to encourage those laggards to get a move on. So you chase them down, ask them to come back and re-engage because I want people to get great value. But because I've built a system, I mean, I have got uh, a real body of work there. When someone asks me a question, it's very easy for, for me to, to say, uh, okay, Pat, you want to know how to sell memberships on autopilot? I created a training just on that specific topic. Here it is, and I link to it. So that really only takes 30 seconds. I've got it down to around about 30 minutes per day to manage my forum, uh, which has over 500 members now, and the average member is paying over $1,000 a year. So I think the average member value is $1,500. So that actually pays quite well. If, if you could make half a million dollars a year and work 30 minutes a day, would you take that deal? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And then the high-level program actually makes significantly more because the average customer value for that is over $20,000 and there's around about 30 people in that program. And, uh, it, it, and then above that sits my cream of the crop, like the percentage deal type uh, situation. And, and those quietly add – a recurring income and they're starting to get more passive because there's no specific deliverable involved for that and i want to just make one differentiation and i think you've sort of covered this quite well with passive income often there's a bit of a setup right mm -hmm. so i like to treat my business as the cash generator and then it's what i do with the income that makes it more passive where i put that into property or currency or uh, other investments. I mean, it could be anything. It could be surfboards or, or what have you. Uh, it could be cash in the bank that you move around depending on uh, what the best foreign exchange rates might be. But I like to put a bit of attention onto how I'm going to grow my investments. Uh, we have what we call superannuation. I think that's what you call 401k. Mm -hmm. But if you work hard on that, your money can really go and do something valuable. So I've spent a little bit of time in the last year or two thinking more carefully about what I'm going to do with all this cash flow and where I want to put it and how I'm going to grow that into uh, an unassailable war chest, right. you know, that gives me the, the confidence to not have to take on any kind of business that doesn't feel good to me. And that's the ultimate dream, I think. But, you know, a lot of people listening to this are like, man, this is... You know, James, he's living the dream. I, I, I could never do that. But well, I think, I think, I, I think they can, and I think if you're realistic about it, a lot of this has to do with your business model, and a lot of it has to do with your relationship with yourself. That sounds weird, so I want to unweird that. I mean, it's, it's your mindset. It's the way you think about things. For a lot of people, they have a strange relationship with money, mm -hmm. and other people have a little bit of a self-esteem challenge, feeling this, this imposter syndrome, I'm not good enough. Uh, and I shared in a recent training that I did about podcasting that when I started podcasting, uh, someone who I respect said to me, hey, I listened to your recording. And I said, oh, great. He goes, you sound so boring. I just couldn't finish it. <laughs> so it's, it's like, okay, not only do I not like the sound of my own voice, I've had other people validate that fact for me. <laughs> and despite that, I've still racked up over 700 podcasts because ultimately I'm just going to get on with it. So when we can overcome this need to worry so much about what other people think, that's when we can truly take it on. And if we're responsible to ourselves, that's really all that matters. Because if you can look after yourself, then you'll be a great provider for others around you and you won't draw on society and you can get focused on creating value. And you can also align yourself with things that feel good. There's no shame in doing things that make you feel good. So if someone listening to this is thinking, well, it's okay for James, 
Uh, but you know, he's he's been doing this for a while. He was, you know, he's lucky or whatever else. I'd say, well, read the book. <laughs> the book was written for you. It's like I actually wrote the book for my four kids, and I handed it to them. And I said, this is what I've been up to, and I hope it saves you years of stress and effort because in that book are things like a profit formula that hardly any business owners know, like hardly any. I'd say less than one in a 100 business owners would know the profit formula. But I want my kids to know that, and I know you're super passionate about your children. Yeah, but if you absolutely. Could, if you can harness the ideas around the profit formula, if you can – uh, get a hold of a good business model where you go straight for high paying offers and you can actually shortcut the time that it took me to figure this stuff out. And the other thing is you can actually get help from people like you and I, you know, Pat, you've got solutions for people. I've got solutions for people. Uh, yesterday when I was walking down to my local beach, I live right next to two beaches. I can choose between two beaches and come in the other way was this lady who I recognize. She's a seven times world surfing champion and she must live in my street because I've seen her several times. And I said, hey, is it small? She goes, yes, and it's crowded. I would suggest you go over to the other beach. And I said, thank you for the tip. So I crossed the road and went to the beach. So here's a seven times world champion giving me a tip. I'd be crazy not to take it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's so many resources out there and books and podcasts. And I think you just have to stay focused on, you know, what it is that you want and what you're trying to do next and learn about that from those who you want to learn from. I think. Yes. You know, and first switch of all, all the rest of them off. I think that's where the discipline comes in. Yeah. It. I mean, I, I talked to somebody today who I think it was a tweet or an Instagram message and they're like, Pat, I listened to all your podcast episodes in the last two months, like 300 plus episodes. And I was like, that's. That's amazing, but that's a lot of time. And they're like, yeah, and I, you know, I just discovered that you have a thousand episodes of Ask Pat and I'm going to hit that next. And I said, no, don't, don't do that. Like, why are you listening to all this stuff and just listening more to more? Like, what, what do you want to do? Um, I'll tell you which episodes to look for. I'll give you that beach tip. Just like your, your friend. Exactly. Friends. This is what I call a supermarket analogy. Uh, that's how my membership works for my members because – when they come in there, um, firstly, they're segmented. And I know you've probably talked about this a fair bit, but I'll just give the quick summary. When someone arrives at my website, I find out what their challenge is, and it's usually one of four. And whatever that one of four is, when they join my membership, I send them information on that one of four. So they're not even seeing three quarters of what's there, just like a supermarket. Mm -hmm. I want to know their shopping list before I let them in. If they say I'm just getting fruit and veg, then I can say, right, it's over here. Grab your cart. We don't worry about the pet food section or the baby section. We just go straight to the part we want and then we check out. And if we can help people use the product better, that gives them a great result. So I'm all about doing less and removing options. And this is where strong filtering comes into it and deciding, you know what, more isn't the best way forward. What's the essential stuff? It's like if you travel with a backpack and you decide, you know what, if I run out of T-shirts, I'll buy one when I'm there instead of trying to bring a suitcase the size of a bar fridge, a washing machine. <laughs> so I wonder why do those people even travel? They want every single thing from home <laughs> just in case. We need to travel lighter in business and in life. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked a little bit earlier about our relationship with money. Um, I, think, I think we also have a relationship with selling and – you know, I remember, for example, I went to a conference in 2013 that I didn't know was going to be a pitch fest the entire time. And because of that, I had just told myself that I would never, ever, ever pitch on stage ever. Like it was the, just the grossest thing to me. And it was because of that experience. But then I was asked to do it in 2017. And that was way out of my box, but it was for a friend. And I sold my podcasting course on stage. And I was able to close like 35% of the room. And it was the probably one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. And thankfully, my friend kind of pushed me to do it. Um, very high level uh, coach in, in that way, just like yourself. But, you know, I think we all suffer a little bit from past experiences and in, in selling, especially online. We get sold to all the time in ways that are just disgusting. And that 
allows us to accept the fact that we probably shouldn't sell at all sometimes. And so how do you address those who are struggling with selling? And I know you talked about this in, in Australia. I'd love to, for you to touch on that because it was really eye-opening for me to hear that as I was somebody who was just starting to come out with my own courses at the time too. And it really helped me. And I'd love for you to help everybody else who's struggling with that as well. Right. It's such a great question. And Darren asked me to create that presentation specifically for his audience who are predominantly bloggers. And I see this is a challenge. Um, and it's understandable. There are terrible salespeople out there. I hate those pitch fests as well. So it comes down to your definition of what sales is and then an understanding of the way that things happen. So I liked this uh, thing I learned. It was called activator behavior consequence. And the way that it was explained to me is if you go up to a vending machine because you're hungry and you put a coin in the machine, so that's your behavior, right? So your, your activator is you're hungry. Behavior is you put a coin in the machine and push the button. Consequence, the food comes out, right? Mm -hmm. That's what should happen. Now, if you go to the vending machine and you put the coin in and push the button, but the food doesn't come out, let's say it gets jammed or uh, it, it's stuck, then how many times will you do that? Will you do it tomorrow or the next day or the day after? Probably not. And that's because uh, the consequence is not getting you the desired results. So if you've had a bad sales experience, you've been ABC'd, you know, you went to the event, uh, it, it wasn't because you thought you wanted to learn. So activator, you want to learn. Behave, you go to the event. Consequence, feeling terrible. Right. So in order to change that, we need a different setup. So I have this definition of selling that, that works well for me. I think I learned it from Neil Rackham from spin selling. But it's more or less that selling is just a, the process of change from one situation to a better alternative situation. So the only thing that matters to me is will the customer be better off? If the customer will be better off, then you shouldn't have any concern around helping someone be better off. I think that's a noble thing to do. And where people go wrong is I think the salespeople at those nasty pitch fests and, you know, I've spoken at some of those places and I was really disgusted by some of the other people on the stage. Uh, and a hot tip, if someone is speaking all year long about internet marketing, their internet marketing business is probably not that great if it's a pitch fest. Uh, that's a <laughs> hot tip. So anyway, <clears throat> I left that world because I was disenchanted with the quality of the people there. But the problem was they were more focused on their mortgage or their car payment or their next yacht than they were on the customer are being better off. If you, as a product creator, are wanting to help people be better off, then help people be better off. Explain clearly to them how will they be better off. You know, and I talk about how you can sort of go through that. Um, you know, who are you, and, and what have you got, and how much does it cost, and um, how will people be better off if they have this thing? And uh, in fact, if they don't have it, will they be worse off? It's okay if you let them know that as well. And if they don't like it, can they give it back? All of these sort of things. But I think if you're an ethical and responsible human and you really care about people being better off, then it's okay to sell. It's not something dirty that people do to each other. It's just a process of change. So Pat, when you offer a product that helps someone become a better podcaster, then they buy that product and they go from where they were to being an enhanced podcaster and getting better results and bringing an income for their family, which they reinvest back into society and pay taxes and help hospitals and all of that stuff. Um, maybe maybe not in America, but it's certainly in other countries. <laughs> A lot of it goes back into medical system and so forth. Pro probably always goes into a uh, war chest. But either way... Yeah, that's um, a different discussion. You, you yeah. can feel okay about it. You can feel good about helping someone be better off. Okay, let me let me let me follow that up with, and I agree with you 100. I mean, my phrase that I always say is, "You can sell and serve at the same time." Um, if you want to help people, then why not just give it away for free? Uh, it's an interesting question because I don't, I don't think you or I can be in a position to help many people if we're scraping by. I think you lower yourself to uh, a, a common level like mm -hmm. 
if I'm not earning an income by creating value, then I'm not going to be funded to continue podcasting and coaching people. Uh, it's just, you know, I will have to go and uh, seek welfare <laughs> for my family mm -hmm. and be a drain on society. And I stop giving value. I, I can't. So, I mean, Anne Ryan wrote a whole book on this called Atlas Shrugged. It's like, you know, it's kind of what if the entrepreneurs just stop doing what they're doing? Well, if you don't pay them, I think they will stop doing what they do. It's okay to earn. And I like what Ricardo Semler said, uh, that if you feel like you have to give back, it means you took too much. <laughs> so it's okay to uh, to to take on um, things and not get paid. And I often help people without payment, and I feel okay with that. But I also don't mind charging if I can help someone be better off, then it's really just a token of the value that I've created. And in my world, where I'm not using any trickery or uh, s special snazzy tactics or um, crazy <laughs> smoke and mirrors, uh, people only make a decision to go forward if they feel they'll be better off. And I like to place that decision in the customer's hands. Sure, I will create an environment where it's easy for them to make a good decision to move forward, but it's ultimately up to them. I'm not going to force them or cajole them uh, or shame them into going forward. So mm -hmm. look for those signs in marketing. If you see them run away, they just don't understand what selling is. They, they come from a bad school of sales. I try selling. I charge for my offer and people are coming back to me and they're saying, you're charging too much. Yeah, so mean? maybe it's a, it means that the offer is not a good message to market match. You're not helping that person see how they'll be better off to be in a position where it's an easy decision. So work harder on communicating the offer in a clearer way or don't show those people the offer. That sounds kind of weird, but I do this. When someone comes to my website, I ask them two questions and based on the two questions – uh, that they answer, I will show them a different offer. There's no point showing the wrong person an offer that's not a good fit for them. So I really try hard to get the right offer to that person. And here's the crazy thing. One of those offers puts them in a position where they are able to invest $10,000 in themselves via my higher level coaching. And the type of person who needs that is extremely attracted to that offer. And I've had people come to my site and within 24 hours of coming to my site, they've joined the program and sent me $10,000. So that really shatters a lot of the myths about price perception and ascension model, moving people along this very slow moving Python to get to the other end. Yeah, Tripwire you know, to move, higher offer to well, highest. And move people to the appropriate offer for where they're at. So it, if there's a message to market disconnect, you may be getting that kind of feedback. So work hard on your offer or your customer filtering so that you can become as relevant as possible. That's the name of the game. It's got to be relevant. Uh, so if even the customer knows they'll be better off, that would be ideal. Great answer. Thank you. What can we entrepreneurs do to work less? Where, where can we start cutting out usually? You can cut out a lot, as it turns out. Um, you talked about the 80-20. Mm -hmm. Well, most people know that, uh, but here's one tip. Most people's teams don't know that. So you, the entrepreneur, might know that, but have you sat down with your team and told them about it? It's so what I found when I did this with my team. They didn't know about the 80-20, and I helped my team understand where in our business – is the biggest gain. So let's say at, at one point in my business, we actually had a thousand websites. Now, don't freak out about that. We had an SEO business. We, we, had over, yeah, we were making over a million dollars a year and, and part of that, and this is about seven years ago, was the ability to rank just about anything by using our own network of websites. And that doesn't really work so much anymore and I definitely wouldn't advise it. But back then, it was fine. It was before Panda and all of those slaps. And it was fine, but I would actually help our team understand, you know, of all the websites we have, the one that really matters the most is is actually the site where we sell all our products and services. That site must be always up to date. It must work on a mobile. It must load quickly. That's the site that makes all the money that allows all the other sites 
to be part of the solution. So if we have to go and update plugins or there's a security thing, do that site first. That is our 80-20. And they're like, okay, boss, got it. And this is the same. I, I actually explained to them why we're doing things, but of all the things we do, if we had to make a choice, this is the one that we really must do and the rest we could take it or leave it. It's, it's kind of akin to think, thinking about if you had to jump out of a plane, you know, which backpack has the parachute in it? Go for that one. Uh, so, yes, if you tell the team, that helps. But if you're 80-20, the 20, it turns out that from that 4%, it's actually responsible for 64% of your results. So for most people who are taking a lot of courses or have set up a whole lot of offers online, like little products or whatever, there'll be some that sell really well. Uh, let's take a look at your income report, Pat. If you were to go through your income report, I would guess that one or two of the things that you promote make most of your income and then all the rest put together sort of don't even come close. This is true. Uh, the, the further down the line you go. So basically what it comes down to is if you really only focused on the top one or two, you could get a, a massive incremental gain. So that's really the situation I had when I was, you know, way back nearly 10 years ago, well, actually 10 years ago, when I had that one product responsible for all of my income. It's incredibly dangerous. Um, but luckily, I had a salary uh, back then as well. If you could just focus on expanding that and, and growing it and having total market dominance, then that's usually a better return on investment than setting up a whole brand new venture with a big, steep learning curve and going through all the motions. And I actually learned a lot about this from a very lazy boss that I had. He really would just phone it in. He, he owned the place that I worked for. Mm -hmm. And he would just turn up at 10 in the morning, have a coffee, disappear most of the day, pop in at four or five in the afternoon, have a coffee and then go home. And that was about it for about four years. <laughs> and I was running the show. But it was amazing. All the stuff that we thought was important that we sent up to his office to make decisions or whatever, and that he never answered once or approved anything it all just got done it just got done uh you know like a bucket of water if you take your hand out it just rearranges itself so it would be amazing if you just uh stop doing some things nobody will notice no one will say a thing if you stop promoting your least performing products it wouldn't cause a ripple in the world if you look at your to-do list, you circle the three things that have by far the greatest impact, and then you put the rest of the to-do list in your top drawer, you may not ever even open it. And I don't know about you, but I've often found old to-do lists and looked at it, and a lot of them I actually just did anyway, and some of them I never did, and it didn't make any difference. That's hard to do, though, because we always feel like we have to do all those things. Well, I've really worked hard on not feeling like I have to do all of them. I just work hard on thinking of all of these, which one really, really must be done. And I'm just not going to worry about the rest. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go and surf instead. And as long as I do that one thing. So in my business now, the thing that drives my business, and, and this is great because it sort of arches back to the previous question. You said with my coaching model, it's not passive. That's true. However, it's very leveraged. If I do one podcast a week, which takes me around about 45 minutes, let's say, if I just record one podcast a week, that drives my seven-figure business in terms of marketing. I don't normally run paid ads. I don't do launches. I don't have affiliates. So I'm not doing a lot of the things that people spend an enormous amount of time and energy on. I'm just doing a podcast a week and that drives my machine and the machine uh, delivers me customers and I'm able to service those customers because I've already got a supermarket in place and I already know which aisle to send them to. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. And I think the question I want to finish off with here today is how does the podcast do that for you? Uh, like, well, what's the offer um, on the podcast? How do you, how do you get them from there to, to get into the machine? So I probably do it a bit differently to experts like you and, and some of your friends, Pat, but I don't have sponsors. I sponsor my own podcast. Mm -hmm. Every episode will have a call to action to join Superfast Business Membership. So that that's the purpose of the podcast. I do it by 
hoping to help someone be better off enough that they listen to the podcast and don't unsubscribe. And I do always ask them to do something. Usually it's to buy my product. So I have no qualms about that because I know if they're listening to it and they resonate that I can help them be better off. I'm just in terms of metrics, because I'm sure this is really interesting to you because of your audience, I think I'm just about to cross 3 million downloads. So that's really not a lot of downloads for how long I've been doing it since about 2009. So I've been just chipping away at it with my ugly voice, with uh, no theatrical training, etc. I did do acting classes, mind you, but you know, never been a radio announcer. I don't have sponsors there's no crazy format i just organically do what is on the mind of my audience or i talk with people who are really interesting who i want to share with my audience and i mean i've had you on my podcast as well Mm -hmm. pat but i i like breaking new people too i don't always want the people doing the circuit Mm -hmm. i want people who can add value to my customer if i can help people be better off some of those people will turn from a listener into a customer. And some of them actually might take seven or eight years. It, it can actually take a long time. I've had people definitely take four or five. They they eventually say, I've been listening to your podcast. I've got so much value. I, I've had some changes in my business and I think I'm now ready for your help. And that's the sort of thing I want to see. Dave, thank you for answering that question and kind of open up, opening up the box for us. Uh, pretty, pretty spectacular, you know, because just for comparison – you guys, I, I'm I'm close to approaching 50 million downloads for the Smart Passive Income podcast. Yeah, like you are absolute King Kong. <laughs> you have you have the most incredible audience, uh, and you're also a wonderful performer. I've seen you present. You are meticulous. You put so much effort into it. Everything from your videos. I mean, you're the benchmark. And I look up to guys like you in terms of well, that's the high quality bar. I don't come anywhere close to that. I just chip away at, at in a unperfectionist way, and that's that's okay with me. Because unlike a lot of businesses, I'm spending the majority of my time serving my existing customers. Because 99.9% of my customers are recurring subscription customers, and my only real job is to provide value for them and keep them. If I do that, getting customers isn't really my headache. It's never been my headache. They come to me. They're attracted. And doing things like a book certainly helps. Appearing on podcasts as a guest, definitely a great thing to do. And as long as I have that baseline, the business will be fine. And I'm not spending eight hours a day trying to figure out how to work out uh, you know, Facebook ad campaigns. Mm-hmm. That's That's not where I want to spend my time and energy. That was me. 10 years ago when I was driving paid traffic. But there's a story about that in the book where I ran out of money one Christmas because I drove so much traffic to an offer that they went broke because they couldn't deliver and everyone cancelled and they never paid me. So it was a a risky lesson and uh, and one that that makes me, you know, activate a behaviour consequence. Mm -hmm. I'm a little wary of building a high-octane business that requires – uh, a lot of moving parts. I like this slow chugging diesel that I've got. Well, you know, maybe that's the answer for a lot of people. And, you know, I look up to you as well for somebody who I think if I were to adopt a lot of how you do what you do, um, you know, I'd see even more results and, and be even be able to help even more people. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but I have a lot of big goals that are outside of the smart passive income world that are going to require a lot of, uh, a lot more leveraging of, of my time. And that's where, you know, people like yourself come into play. And I'm, just super appreciative of you uh, and inspired. So thank you, James. I appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody's inspired as well. Um, they want to they want to hang out with you. They want to see what you're up to. Where should they go? Oh, I've got zillions of podcasts at superfastbusiness.com. Just watch out though. My voice isn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Pat, you asked incredibly good questions. You can tell you've, you've earned your 50 million downloads. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. You know, a lot of that comes with just like you chugging along and learning as I go and um, just seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And so superfastbusiness.com, superfastbusiness is the name of the podcast. Work Less, Make More by James Tramko on Amazon. We'll have all the links at the show notes. Uh, James, thank you, man. I appreciate you, bud. You too, Pat. Thank you. 
All right, I hope you enjoyed that interview with James Schramko. Again, you can find him at superfastbusiness.com and also the Super Fast Business Podcast, which you should all subscribe to and listen to right now. Like he says, there's a lot of stuff there, so I would actually handpick the sort of things that are interesting to you in his little, quote, supermarket like he talked about. But man, what a great episode. I'm just so thankful that he had the time to come on. You know, he's uh, he's in Australia and I'm in the US, so I stayed up a little bit late for this, but that's okay, because you know what? I'm here for you to serve you, and I hope that you feel James served you as well. Uh, I felt he served me in that conversation too, so I ho- I'm hoping you feel the same. Make sure to check him out, and again, thank you so much for sticking around. The show notes for this available, it's gonna be a very valuable set of show notes from all the things that James talked about. You can find it at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 319. And I t- just wanted to take a moment today just to thank you so much for uh, listening in and being a part of this podcast with me. You know, this wouldn't be here without you and all the reviews and all the fans and just the thank yous. And, you know, even for those of you who silently download this and listen to it, um, you mean the world to me. Thank you so much. Uh, No sponsors in this episode. I wanted to take this moment just to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being amazing. And um, I'm looking forward to serving you in the next episode. So if you haven't yet subscribed to this podcast, now is the time to do it. Just hit the subscribe button. And I just want to say one more time, I appreciate you. Cheers, take care, and I'll see you and looking forward to serving you in the next episode of the SPI Podcast. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey there, and thanks for sticking around to the end. If you're looking for more great shows like this one, definitely give How Success Happens a listen, another great show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. On How Success Happens, Robert Tuckman features some of today's brightest entrepreneurial minds talking about overcoming challenges and viewing them as learning experiences to create success. The challenges that entrepreneurs face are ultimately what make many of us successful, however we define success, and that's what the show is all about. There's lots of names you'll surely recognize on the show every single week. Just recently, Robert had Nasty Gal CEO Sophia Amoruso on the show and the former CEO of Snapple the week before that, which is really awesome. So listen to How Success Happens right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.